myself, and my role here is simply um, that of the moderator, which means especially to make sure we stick to the time. The turbo presenters um, in the last part of this afternoon have just 90 seconds to deliver their projects, while the two speakers now have um, 180 minutes. Um, no, well, they have 60, 60 minutes, which is 30 minutes um, each to deliver their speech. Um, the first of our speaker today is Professor Andrzej Nowak, who is professor at the Polish Institute of the Polish Academy of Sciences and the History Institute of the Jagolian University. He's also president of the Council of the Institute of National Remembrance and um, of the um, Presidential National Development Council. Um, Professor Nowak will um, address the issue of violence in um, Eastern and Central Europe. And um, our second speaker was supposed to be Professor Arnold Supan from the University of Vienna. Um, unfortunately, though, um, Professor Supan has been taken ill and cannot be here today. Um, he sent a 40-page paper which will be summarized by our colleague of um, um, the network, Bartosz Jewanowski. Uh, and so Bartosz will have the tough challenge of summarizing a 40-page paper in um, a short presentation. We then have about 40, 40 minutes for discussion. So I propose we first give the floor to Andrzej Novak, then we have the summary of um, Arnold Supan's paper, and we will have questions and discussion after both um, lectures. So please, Professor Supan. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm really honored to be invited uh, for a presentation of an Eastern European perspective on violence in the 20th century. But I would like to begin with something like a polemic with this, uh, with this concept of uh, juxtaposing Eastern European and Western European perspectives. Um, I think that uh, it is worth uh, reminding that most of Eastern Europeans uh, didn't know that they are Eastern Europeans until maybe 20th century exactly, because uh, the very name of Eastern Europe was invented as Larry Wolf uh, presented that in his uh, wonderful monography by French philosophers in the end of the, the 18th century. Uh, so, for example, one can ask whether there are Eastern Belgians and or Western Belgians. I know that there are Flamands and Valons, but what about Eastern Belgians and Western Belgians? This could be just a creation, just an intellectual creation. And it could be also interpreted as an element of uh, symbolic violence, of symbolic or civilizational violence, uh, of imposing uh, names and with them. Uh, some uh, intellectual constructs onto uh, uh, all regions uh, from centers of intellectual authority. But nevertheless, yes, we can say that there are interesting elements that enable us to speak meaningfully about differences uh, in violence experiences in the 20th century between Eastern and Western parts of Europe, generally speaking. In order to understand, to introduce into these differences, I would use uh, two very powerful names. Uh, that is Marx and Lenin. Uh, first, I would like to introduce uh, not Groucho Marx, not Karl Marx, but Anthony Marx, uh, a political scientist from Columbia University, who published maybe 12 years ago a very interesting book uh, in Oxford University Press uh, called Fate in Nation. And in that book, uh, he presented early modern, uh, early modern, uh, so to speak, processes of construction of early nation states in Spain, France, and in England. All these uh, early modern practices uh, were highly exclusionary, based on exclusion of particular uh, religions, for example, Catholic in England, 
protestant in France, uh, uh, specific uh, groups of people, for example, Jews were already ejected from Western Europe to Eastern Europe. And so uh, with that uh, advancement on the road to nation state, with that advancement to democracy and liberalism, this uh, uh, exclusionary practices, says Anthony Marx, were somehow vital step in that direction. And in Eastern Europe, uh, societies uh, didn't make that step uh, in early modern period. So one can say that we have to take into consideration that nation making, uh, and with that, modern democracy making and conflicts connected to that uh, and exclusionary practices connected to that that had been already uh, passed in Western part of Europe in 16th, 17th and 18th centuries were uh, part of Eastern European experience in the 20th century. And many times they were observed from Western perspective as somehow barbarous in the 20th century, as somehow um, uh, very strange and very violent. So I would like to uh, quote very shortly uh, uh, something like a summary of uh, Anthony Marx's argument. Uh, the cohering effect of exclusion and intolerance is still reflected in the West's views of the rest of the world denigrating others as a basis of cohering us was not only central to the origins of Western nationalism and then justifications of colonialism. It is also recapitulated in our current denigration of latecomers to nationalism. Ironically, as Western Europe now begins to move beyond national solidarities, its own coherence as a developed bloc is again solidified by distinguishing itself as more consistently civic than those others still fitfully forging national unity. Thus the West is itself distinguished and thereby given coherence by denigrating the rest, or Eastern Europe, and by pretending that our own past was somehow different, mimicking the pattern by which our own earlier national level solidarities were forged and then forgotten. The West's idealization of its past has indeed gone hand in hand with denigration of those who were encouraged, attempted, and failed to live up to that noble standard Western civic nationalism has been contrasted with uh, the ethnic or exclusionary forms later adopted uh, by East or South. So here you have something like a perception, perception from the West on the problems with nationalism in Eastern Europe in the 20th century, nationalism seen as the core, as the essence, as the source of violence. Now, very shortly, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Exactly 100 years ago, he uh, published his probably one of the most incisive uh, books, analysis, I mean, uh, his treatise, Imperialism as the Highest Stage of Capitalism. Uh, in that study, he uh, presented a concept according to which uh, uh, most of Western European countries uh, existing at the time uh, not only were able to uh, eliminate or at least to make minimal social and economic conflicts in their metropolis to, uh, due to the fact that they had powerful colonial uh, um, possessions, but, uh, and this is my development of Lenin's argument, Western European countries, now nine uh, countries of contemporary uh, European Union that had uh, overseas colonies, mo most of them, actually all of them in, in Western Europe, also were able to export violence outside of Europe, outside of their uh, countries of their metropolis. For example, if uh, there uh, uh, was such a situation in Eastern Europe during the last decade of the 19th century, as it happened in Central Africa, in a colony ruled by uh, 
Belgian King administration where 5 to 10 million uh, Central African dwellers perished. Probably it would be one of the greatest elements of contemporary European memory. But these 10 million Africans disappeared almost completely from, I would say, even uh, public problems with public space uh, in Belgium. You have many monuments to that king who is responsible for that 10 million people died. Uh, so yes, Western Europe exported much of its uh, violence uh, outside of Europe, while Eastern Europe was dominated during the, uh, the early period of the 20th century, actually by three empires, not national states, but empires. German Empire, Russian Empire, and Habsburg Empire. And they clashed, finally, in 1914. Uh, and this is a real beginning of real experience of differences in violence between East and West, Eastern Europe and Western Europe. Why? Because we have Eastern Front and Western Front. And this is really a slightly different uh, experience. Why it is different? Uh, I would say that uh, as regards um, devastating military campaigns, uh, brutal occupation regimes, probably uh, experiences are not that different between East and West. Uh, maybe uh, uh, for a longer time and on a much larger space, these uh, brutal occupation regimes existed in Eastern Europe, covering contemporary Poland, Ukraine, Belarusia, Latvia, uh, Lithuania, um, and some parts of uh, uh, Carpathian uh, region, uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to mention only a few of these uh, of these territories. Uh, but uh, what was also interesting uh, difference is the fact that Eastern Europe experienced a uh, huge uh, uh, mass uh, violent migrations of several millions of people that were uh, forced to leave uh, their original dwellings and evacuated, uh, as it was called, with uh, their uh, dominating armies, imperial armies of Russia or of uh, Austria or of uh, Germany. Actually, Germany was uh, always uh, advancing to the east. So this is only the, the experience of Austrian and Russian uh, uh, side of that conflict. But the most important difference connected to the violence was the fact that uh, war meant uprooting millions of peasant soldiers. As regards also peasant soldiers existing in uh, the Western Front, uh, they identified themselves, even pr in the pre-war period, as Frenchmen, as Germans, or as Englishmen. They had given set from early modern or late modern uh, times uh, uh, national identity. Uh, and as regards Eastern Europe, these millions of peasants, many of them illiterate, were objects of fight for creating nations, of nation process, and anti-imperial fight as well, and social, uh, I would say, goals uh, that motivated fate, uh, so to speak, uh, so to speak, um, war for their, uh, for their uh, identities. And uh, that, uh, uh, that made changes connected with World War uh, I much more uh, disruptive uh, in terms of changes and of further violence, uh, of continuation of that violence in Eastern Europe than in Western Europe. Probably even more important uh, difference as regards the most tragic experience of violence connected to World War I, was the fact that while in Western part of Europe, it was, uh, so to speak, accepted or rejected rather as a suicide in the trenches, a completely absurd, finally, conflict, which gave nothing good but victims, 
This is the beginning of the evolution towards victims, towards pacifism uh, that uh, would win finally in the 60s of the 20th century. But not in Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe, however, almost that many people were killed on Eastern Front as uh, on, uh, the Western Front, um, on the Western Front. There were uh, Poles, Latvians, Lithuanians, Estonians, Finns, Czechs, Slovaks, and Yugoslavs, I lumped them together especially, that uh, understood the war as uh, leading towards something good, towards forming their, or creating they, their nation states, their new uh, uh, identities, and a uh, new, better future connected with the hope that they would be able to build their own, so to speak, national home uh, on the ruins of former empires, uh, uh, German, uh, Russian, uh, Hungarian. Um, but there were also other experiences in Eastern Europe worth mentioning that uh, also influenced further developments of, um, of the problem of mass violence in the 20th century in Eastern Europe. That is, nations that lost World War I uh, in, on the East. Uh, among them, uh, there were Hungary, of course, was Bulgaria, uh, was Russia, and uh, was Germany. And with that, there comes uh, something like revanchism, the, the dream to revenge for the uh, losses, for lost territories, for lost greatness, to recreate imperial domination over these nations that had been under uh, these imperial nations on, or imperial cause uh, tutelage before the war. And this also makes uh, an important, uh, I would say, element uh, uh, at play in the development of, uh, of future mass violence in the region. Uh, However, uh, it is uh, also very uh, important to note the fact, uh, or an interpretation rather than the fact, that uh, within Europe, within geographically given Europe, so to speak, we've had many different cultures, also in Eastern Europe, different cultures as regards violence, uh, creation and violence reception. For example, Vladimir Bocharov, an eminent Russian sociologist, anthropologist, um, uh, wrote a book on a specific uh, culture of uh, violence uh, that developed uh, throughout the history in Russia. Uh, according to uh, his uh, argument, uh, maybe I will quote very shortly, um, Violence was treated uh, in uh, that particular Russian political culture as an inherent attribute of power. The authorities not only may but also must refer by tradition to violence if they are to hold power. And this is violence against their subjects. For Bocharov, such a phenomenon is quite typical of generally speaking non-Western societies in general. This internal violence is presented to the subject as a model of parental authority. Its task is to separate society from dark forces and destabilization agents, of course, by using violence. In such a case, uh, sacrifice was natural, socially accepted, so to say. Uh, so I would say that even if this uh, analysis is not uh, totally accurate as regards different particularities of Russian history. Nevertheless, it, uh, it is important to note that there are different um, cultures of violence, and some of them were or uh, are exported to other countries with imperial power. This was exactly the experience of many nations that were subjugated to Russian empire throughout 18th or 19th century and uh, either uh, accepted some elements of that particular uh, state violence culture or fought against this. And with that fought, uh, 
uh, with that fight, sorry, uh, joining in that, uh, with, uh, in that fight with uh, anti-Tsarist, uh, so to speak, uh, forces within Russia itself, it accepted or different uh, nationalities uh, creating their uh, new national projects in the second half of the 19th century and fighting for realizing that project. Uh, collaborated uh, on a, a given moment or the development with a central uh, Russian imperial uh, or anti-imperial, I should say rather, forces. Those depicted by Dostoevsky in the possessed. Uh, revolutionary forces. And throughout that fight, there was developed exactly the phenomenon which we are discussing today so vehemently, the phenomenon of terrorism. Of course, it was well dispersed in the second half of the uh, 19th century already in southern and western Europe. But it was especially, uh, I would say, well embedded in that fight within uh, the Russian state violence structure and uh, rebellions against that state violence structure. Uh, one should uh, recollect not only the names of Bakunin or Kropotkin, but one could recollect also the names of uh, Josef Piłsudski or, uh, uh, or uh, first, uh, uh, sorry, second and third president of the Second Republic in Poland. They were all terrorists in the beginning of their careers. They prepared bombs. Uh, some of them uh, made attempts against imperial powers uh, of Russia. And this is not only Polish example. This is an example that was uh, treated already in the beginning of the 20th century as examples of imperial culture of state violence uh, transferred, transported to its uh, non-Russian peripheries. Uh, and with that, we can come back to Lenin and to his particular case, which unites many levels uh, of analyzing uh, the problem of mass violence in the 20th century, especially in Eastern Europe. One is personal level uh, that unites the experience of state violence with the answer made by Lenin. His uh, older brother was hanged for uh, participating in an uh, attempt of a coup against Alexander III, uh, Russian Tsar. This, of course, this obviously influenced uh, this example of state uh, terrorism or of state violence, uh, uh, influenced Lenin personally, on personal level. Of course, one can say that traditions of state violence in a much broader meaning of these traditions, as Bocharov mentioned uh, in Russian tradition in general, also influenced his way of developing state violence once he took power. But it is not only Russian tradition. Richard Pipes would agree with that kind of uh, I would say, interpretation of uh, specific violence stemming from Russia in the 20th century and dispersing all over uh, Eastern and Central Europe. But this is not only that a particular, uh, uh, I would say, background for a specificity of mass <laughs> violence there stemming from Russia. Another is, of course, ideology, ideology that was developing from the sources uh, already existing in Western Europe, uh, but uh, developing in a special way. I would like to quote um, from the very first day of Lenin uh, uh, realization of his power in uh, November 1917, when uh, the Congress of Soviets decided to abolish the death penalty for frontline deserters. Uh, which uh, uh, Kerensky had reintroduced in mid-1917. Lenin, uh, busy elsewhere, missed that event. Uh, and when he learned of it, he became utterly indignant. Nonsense, he said. How can you make a revolution without executions? Do you expect to dispose of your enemies by disarming yourself? What other means of repression are there? Prisons, 
who attaches significance to that during a civil war, when each side hopes to win. It is a mistake, impermissible weakness, pacifist illusion. So uh, we can not only quote uh, many expressions like that on the part of Lenin, but also uh, we can uh, mention uh, many examples of uh, that kind of ideology uh, realizations. What is interesting, that one of these uh, realizations was uh, connected again with uh, previous uh, experiences of Western European colonial empires. I mean concentration camps. They were introduced as a new means of mass violence by the Bolshevik regime already in 1918, but they were based on two examples, one American in Cuba, 1898, and English in South Africa in 1901. Uh, and uh, Lev Trotsky, who invented or reinvented the concept of concentration camp, then developed into a labor camp, and only in the Nazi version, Nazi German version, developed into its final, I would say, solution concept of death camp. Uh, Trotsky was well aware that the concept was tested elsewhere, and he introduced it in Europe, though on the fringes of Europe, on the Volga River near Kazan. From that, it developed into the whole Gulag system afterwards. So we have many different, I would say, uh, levels of factors that made violence in Eastern Europe uh, a new uh, phenomenon on European continent. Uh, but, uh, of course, this experience of mass violence was not connected solely with Russian version of communism, with that combination of World War I experience of mass killings, uh, so to speak, habituation of mass killings, uh, which uh, was uh, connected with uh, the Bolshevik ideology and with Russian traditions of state violence. But if we analyze the problem of mass violence in the 20th century Eastern Europe, we have to mention also elements connected to nation building, yes, and uh, fighting for creating new nations, fighting for boundaries, fighting with alien, so, uh, so to speak, alien uh, minorities. Uh, we have these experiences in many countries of Eastern Europe that were created after World War I. I would like to take three examples. Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia. Uh, actually, uh, in uh, all this of these countries, we have not only a nation-state project, but we have something like imperial-like structures, uh, something that, uh, that had elements of a federal, federative um, idea inside, but uh, at the same time, it, it was connected with a rival project of dominating uh, other minorities with uh, the core nation and turning from imperial-like structure, federative structure, to uh, national structure. Why uh, experiences in Poland, in Yugoslavia on one side, and in Czechoslovakia on the other side were different? Because they were different during the interwar period. Maybe part of the answer could be given by linking Poland to Russian political culture experience. Most of Poland, created after World War I, uh, was uh, created on the territories that experienced more than 100 years of Russian imperial influences, control, administrative practices, and this specific culture that even made uh, rebellions against this culture, uh, somehow imitating some elements of that culture. The same uh, applies to Yugoslavia because of the influences of Turkish, Islamic domination over these territories. While Czechoslovakia, 
was based on territories exclusively belonging to Austro-Hungarian Habsburg Empire. It doesn't mean that Habsburg Empire was an ideal empire with no conflicts. Nevertheless, political culture in the late 19th century in Habsburg Empire was evidently slightly different to the one developing in the Russian Empire. Uh, but this is, of course, only partial and very, I would say, provocative uh, suggestion of an answer for the developments of violent clashes between different national projects in these particular countries. I mean, for example, Polish and Ukrainian national project that was not realized fully during World War I and somehow postponed the final clash that would take place during World War II. Another element is connected with the fact of a very, I would say, inconvenient context, both geopolitical, economic, I mean, uh, great crisis in the 30s, and ideological context of uh, the solution of the efforts to solve uh, the tensions connected with different national projects, with different social projects realized uh, during the interwar period in East Central Europe. Uh, these difficult conditions meant that on the western side of East Central Europe, we had German imperial revenge, revenge project uh, looming uh, uh, large uh, very quickly. On eastern side, we've had Soviet uh, communist ideology that already tried to overtake all East Central Europe in 1920, but was stopped at the gates of Warsaw and, uh, and uh, had to recede for 20 years. But it was not only communist ideology. It would be turned more and more by Stalin throughout the 30s into another version of Russian imperial revenge ideology. It was uh, an evident uh, change to the times of Lenin, though not in realities of mass killings because they were already introduced uh, under Lenin's regime, but the rationalization, if one can use that word, or a justification for these mass killings were uh, more and more different under Stalin. He prepared his country uh, to uh, a war in which he would be able to recreate imperial greatness of uh, the Soviet Union, aka Russian Empire. Um, that, that is, for example, uh, the, the reason of one of the uh, least known, least remembered experiences of mass violence in the 20th century. I mean so-called national operations uh, led by NKVD in 1937-1938. Most of the people asked what did it mean. Great terror would uh, answer, of course, old communist guard was executed, old Lenin's comrades were victims, or great Russian uh, cultural representatives like Lev Gumilov, son of Anna Akhmatova, who mourned him uh, in her wonderful requiem. But numerically speaking, but by numbers I mean individual persons, the most numerous uh, of that victims were so-called little nationalities, like Poles. 111,000 people were shot of all 670,000 shot during 1937-1938, just because they were Poles. Germans were the second. Uh, Finns, uh, Koreans, and other nations that were perceived from a, uh, I would say, evidently not Soviet communist ideological perspective, but from Russian imperial revengeist perspective, that they are potential fifth column for rivals of that particular uh, imper imperial project. Um, what came afterwards, of course, what were two, of course, uh, Nazi Germany ideology that uh, coined together revenge, imperial revenge over uh, especially Slavic neighbors, especially against Poles and Czechs, with anti-Semitic, 
uh, deadly uh, component, uh, the core actually component of Nazi ideology uh, that led to elimination, uh, to physical elimination of uh, all, almost all Jewry from East Central Europe. Uh, but that particular experience of World War II that followed, uh, uh, some, uh, that followed uh, the initial, I would say, collaboration of two imperial projects, Russian and German, because this was the essence of the handshake of Molotov and Ribbentrop, not ideology of communism and Nazism, but imperial revanchism ideology to eliminate what is between these two empires in East Central Europe, in Eastern Europe to eliminate Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, um, Romania, and so on and so forth. Czechoslovakia was already eliminated. Uh, so from that perspective, for many after World War II that were overtaken by communist, uh, Russian imperial communist, uh, I would say, pattern of domination and of mass violence connected with that, the uh, rest of a shorter 20th century was perceived as a fight or, uh, uh, or uh, uh, an experience of waging uh, uh, more or less violent war against this uh, foreign occupation of this imperial uh, domination of this ideological uh, conquest uh, made in East Central Europe. And from that perspective, uh, 1989 was seen by many, not by all of course, as liberation. The violence uh, obtained a meaning, finally, meaning of a victory over evil empire, just like after World War I for Eastern Europe, for many nations, for many groups of, uh, I would say, so, uh, social groups in Eastern Europe, not for all of them, of course, but for many of them, World War I, uh, ended with meaningful victory. Violence led to something meaningful, while for Western Europe it was absolutely meaningless, absurd. And something similar happened with, I would say, part of Eastern European or East Central European experiences after 1989, when the new culture of memory already uh, uh, matured in Western Europe uh, tried to and force on Eastern Europe new meaning of the Cold War. The Cold War was a wrong concept. There was no conflict between evil and good. There was an absurd conflict between two equally evil imperial structures. And uh, after Vietnam especially uh, versus Afghanistan, uh, uh, rather perspective of uh, universal victims, not of nations fighting for their uh, independence, for their uh, uh, freedom, was taken as important as, uh, as only acceptable uh, in the end of the 20th century. And now we perceive... Yes, this is the, 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 the last uh, page uh, quickly overturned. Um, now we can come back somehow to the beginning of our lecture, when we see that violence is coming back to Western Europe, coming back from these very far places when the violence was hidden or sent overseas in the 19th century from Western Europe, uh, now uh, from colonized uh, territories to post-colonial Western Europe, violence returns. And from Eastern European perspective, we are tempted, some of us are tempted to look with something like a schadenfreude. You looked uh, with, you Western Europeans, looked at our problems uh, with nation making, with our um, uh, different, I would say, identity politics that you condemned from the uh, high point of your newly achieved, finally achieved post-national, um, I would say, perspective as um, uh, retrograde, as, uh, as barbarous, as too violent. Now we see violence coming to you and can we stay aloof and say that this is not our problem? I would end uh, 
with a short quotation uh, from Joseph Brodsky, American poet of Russian Jewish origin, Nobel Prize laureate for literature in 1987. This was called Bosnia tune. I would call it now London tune or Brussels tune or Paris tune. And it could be addressed to us, Eastern Europeans. As you pour yourself a scotch, crush a roach or check your watch, as your hand adjusts your tie, people die. In the towns with funny names, hit by bullets, caught in flames, by and large not knowing why, people die. In small places you don't know, of yet be having no chance to scream or say goodbye, people die. I will make it short, I will not continue to the end. But I think that the experience of clash, or rather of difference of memories of mass violence, of different reasons for that mass violence on Western or Eastern part of Europe should not lead to a lack of solidarity. The beginning is to talk to each other, to share the experience, to discuss, to debate, just as Professor Wiewiórka said. When we begin to address our different experiences, we can find, again, solidarity versus violence, our common enemy. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, inspiring talk. As I mentioned, Arnold Supan um, has been taken ill and cannot be here, but Bartosz Jewonowski um, courageously um, proposed to summarize his 40-page paper um, in 25 minutes, <laughs> 30 minutes. <laughs> Please, Bartosz. Yes, I have the pleasure to um, read some of the texts of Professor uh, Zupan. Um, I, I took the, the, the right to uh, cross out some of it. If, if it won't sound smooth, then it's my fault. Um, violence in Western Europe in the 20th century. Europe is still suffering from consequences of World Wars I and II, which resulted almost in the self-destruction of Europe. While both wars, in fact the Thirty Years' War of the 20th century, resulted in dozens of millions of killed or heavy wounded soldiers, in dozens of millions of widows and orphans, World War I with almost 16 million deaths, World War II with at least 60 million deaths, Genocides against the Jews, Armenians, Poles, Chechen, Ingush, and Crimean Tatars, more than 35 million of expellees and refugees, as well as destroyed economies and societies, there are two consequences we do feel in reality until present day. On one hand, after both wars, the victors made the wrong, partly bad political, economic, and social decisions which undermined peaceful developments particularly in Eastern Europe. On the other, both wars created remembrances which still strongly divided European nations, like the Germans and the Poles, the Germans and the French, the Germans and the Belgians, and here I could continue until the end of the page, because there are so many uh, possible conflicts. So then Professor Zupan um, speaks about the uh, history of the, uh, inter the First, the Second World War, and the interwar period. And he says that by November 1918, World War I had more than 9.5 million servicemen uh, cost their lives. Um, the ranking within 7 million civilian deaths has, uh, is another side of the war. Uh, the war left 3 million widow widows as well, as many as 10 million orphans and millions of grieving parents, brothers, sisters, friends. Um, the demographic disaster of World War II was even worse, literally the most disastrous in modern history. Uh, as, the Soviet, uh, as the German Soviet war was the epicenter of military action in Europe in World War II, the Soviet Union counted 10 million military losses and Germany 6.5 million, then followed China with 2.5 and Je Japan with 2 million. Concerning the civilian losses, without the Jews, uh, 
The Soviet Union suffered 17 million dead, China 7.5 million, <coughs> Poland 2.7, Germany 2.5. Mm. By um, 1914, Europe possessed a series of international conventions and agreements for the regulation of, and humanization of warfare and the protection of the wounded and prisoners of war. The various Hague and Geneva agreements also forbade the use of particularly dev devastating instruments of war, such as naval blockades aimed at bringing about starvation in the enemy country, explosive rifle bullets and chemical weapons, and artillery and earlier attacks on cities without a war industry. But between 1914 and 1918, neither side respected this Hague convention. Politically, the shootings and lootings benefited mainly the Allies, whose media spread the news of atrocities committed by the Huns, the Germans, and their allies. In the Ottoman Empire, Empire um, the Young Turk government and the Army High Command suspected the Armenians of siding with the invading Russian army and organized the expulsion and massacre of perhaps a million Armenian fellow citizens, including women and children. This was the first true genocide in modern history. World War I was becoming total. It was a war of industrialized manslaughter, particularly at the French and Belgian fronts. War propaganda used the mass media to instill hatred of entire peoples. Military censorship documented the increasing dissatisfaction of the soldiers as well as their relatives with the war. Um, grieving widows, orphaned children, crippled soldiers mingled with the hungry, the unemployed, and the destitute in towns and villages across the continent. New and frightening levels of intense political violence were a characteristic of much of post-war Europe. Be Europe in 1920s and 30s was divided along many fault lines, but the most important was the, the one between those who rejected and those who embraced political violence and home and abroad. However, national conflicts and ethnic racial tensions greatly intensified by, by the Paris uh, peace treaties played a much greater role in Eastern than in Western Europe. Often nationalist hatred singled out Jews as special scapegoats for resentment and social misery. Violence became centrally important, particularly for fascism, national socialism, and communism. Until 1938, Hitler's terror regime killed some hundred Germans and German Jews, Stalin terror, some million Soviet peasants and communist comrades. Violent clashes between Nazis and communist paramilitary par organizations were multiplying, particularly in Berlin. About three quarters of Germans wanted some form of authoritarian uh, government. Now, I will uh, allow myself to skip the Hitler's road to war. Um, then a uh, professor speaks ab about collaboration with Hitler's empire um, by saying that Europe under Nazi leadership experienced between 1939 and 1945 armed conflict, for foreign occupation, aerial bombardments, persecution, concentration and death camps, as well as ferocious civil and ethnic wars. Um, the Nazis also strongly objected the Roma Sinti people, colloquially called gypsies, who were perceived and under, as undermining law and order. Genocide and ethnic cleansing on a gigantic scale were an intrinsic part of the meaning of the war to the German leadership and to the host of subordinated in the military, pol police, and bureaucracy who sought to implement racial policy. Um, then professor speaks about uh, Western countries during war. After the capitulation of France, the northern and western part, as well as Belgium, were ruled as occupied zones under German military administration. Aside from intensive business with the German occupier, contacts between the French and the Germans were mostly on the level of men-women relationship. On the other hand, the Vichy regime took anti-Jewish measures in advance of German requests. Uh, thousands of Jewish refugees from Germany, Austria, and the East were pushed back across the German border. Then in 1941 and 42, the French police arrested and deported thousands upon um, uh, thousands of Jews, many among them born in France, which were sent in Germany 
to the death camps, while in Norway the local authorities and the population were in general uninterested in saving the lives of most of the country's 1,700 Jewish citizens. In collaboration with Denmark, the government and the population, as well as the local German occupation forces, succeed in protecting the lives of nearly all of their 8,000 Jewish inhabitants. Now, the Nazis could deport 106 a uh, thousand Dutch Jews uh, and only 20,000 remained due to a very uh, well prepared list of the Jewish citizens. On the one hand, Denmark was uh, an occupied country, speaking of Denmark. On the other, it provided Germany with invaluable industrial and agricultural goods and served as a much coveted safe haven for German troops in need of rest and recreation. Now the Italy. The Italians were ruthless aggressors, and the tactics and methods of Italian fascists in the 1920s and 30s were no less brutal than those of the German SA and SS. Therefore, Italy's leadership, the political as well as the military, was responsible for the war crimes and crimes against humanity they committed particularly in Abyssinia and Spain. Toward the end of uh, the war, however, tens of thousands of Italian POWs died in, so in Soviet and German captivity. Um, I will skip the collaboration. Now, resistance and reprisal. Resistance involved illegal activity, illegal not only in the eyes of the German, Italian, or other occupation forces, but also according to international conventions and the laws of one's countries. His or her target was seldom a Gestapo agent or a Gesta Gestapo um, uh, or any other um, a German soldier uh, or Italian soldier. More often, the target was a compatriot, a policeman, a factory guard, a railroad engineer, or anyone who's, whom one superior, in, superior in the resistance movement suspected of being a traitor, a spy, an obstacle, or a dangerous rival. To be in resistance required distrusting orders, hiding, lying, threatening, blackmailing, denouncing, and if necessary, killing suspects, even if they were your friends. Resistors in the countryside uh, were often reduced to terrorizing peasants for food. In Western and Northern European countries, only a small segment of the population participated in the resistance. Um, resistance in France became a true mass movement when in early 1943 the German ministry, Minister for Labor Explo Exploitation, Fritz Zaukel, decided to call young West and North Europeans for labor service in Germany. Um, even the post-war Nuremberg court did not attempt to resolve the question of how many uh, hostages could be legally shot for every soldier killed. Um, five for one, ten for one, or perhaps a hundred for one, as the Germans did in Serbia in 1941. On June the 10th, 1944, four days after the beginning of the Operation Overlord, the elite landing in Normandy, a company of the SS Panzer Division Das Reich, passed through the historic province of Limousin um, and was subjected to guerrilla, guerrilla attacks, including the torture and killing of some 40 captured German soldiers in the village of Tule, not far from Oradur sur Glan. The SS company um, entered Oradur and within a few hours killed, mostly by burning them alive, every inhabit inhabitant to a total of 642, including even the smallest of the children. Mm. Now, the German perpetrators argued later that the partisan attacks at Tula and Oradur had been a in violation to, of the Hague and Geneva Conventions as well as the 1940 Ar Armistice Agreement. They all forbade civilian attacks on the military, not to speak of the torture and killing of captive soldiers. Others said that the village church blew up with the women and children not because it had been set on fire by the soldiers, but because partisans had been hiding ammunition there. But German defenders of the culprits still overlooked that clause of the Hague Convention that states that whereas the execution of guerrillas is justified, the torture and killing of their family members and of innocent bystanders are war crimes. <coughs> 
No military code, not even that of the German army, authorized plunder or slaughter of innocents. Remarkably, <clears throat> the 1943 German military regulations went so far as to threaten with punishment the soldier who carried out such uh, orders of his superiors that were in violation of the law. But the monstrous behavior of German troops during World War II in Eastern and Southeastern Europe showed that the military code is useless if the commanders do not bother to enforce it or deliberately disregard it. Now the final solution. Hitler had always believed that Germany was simultaneously fighting two distinct but inseparable wars, an international war against enemy states and a racial war against those alien and pathogenic agents that he believed endangered the German folk. Germany's racial enemies would have to, to be destroyed and its racial inferiors conquered and, and enslaved. Um, on August uh, 22, 1939, Hitler stated, it's not to attain a particular line in the East, but the physical destruction of the enemy, who, after all, speaks today about the annihilation of the Armenians. Final solution was the Nazi term used for the genocide against the European Jews during World War II. The first measure, measure against the German Jews was the expulsion from many hundreds villages and small towns. The second solution was the permission and encouragement to emigration. With the German invasion of Poland in September 1939, a further million and a half came under, uh, of Jews came under German rule, a further million and a half under Soviet rule. Seven units of the SS Einsatzgruppen murdered particularly Polish elite, elite uh, aristocrats, intelligentsia, priests, as well as many Jews. At the concentration camp near Auschwitz, Polish political prisoners faced the worst rigor of punishment, including torture and execution. Gradually, uh, during the winter of 1939 uh, and the early months of 1940, a third solution emerged to be applied to the Jews of Poland. They would be expelled from several thousand lo localities and made to live in restricted areas and ghettos. In June 1941, the German army invaded the Soviet Union. Um, five uh, SS Einsatzgruppen killed automatically all Jews and Soviet political commissars. By November 1941, perhaps as many as 600,000 Jews had been liquidated until summer of 42, about 1 million. During the autumn of 41, experiments were made of n on Soviet prisoners of war and also on Jews to find out the most expeditious method of murder by gas. During the year 1942, the SS under the command of uh, SS Gruppenführer Odilo Globocnik established uh, death camps in the General Gouvernement. Um, the gassing of Jews at Birkenau began in May 1942 and continued until November 44. The trains to Auschwitz-Birkenau came from every region under German rule, from Slovakia and France, from Norway, from the Atlantic coast of France, from Rome, Corfu, Salonika, and Athens. The aim of the final solution was to murder all the Jews of Europe, also from Western Europe. Detail, details of the killing of the Jews at Auschwitz-Birkenau and other extermination camps did not reach Geneva, London, and New York until the summer of 1944, a full two years after the killings had begun. In many countries, museums and memorials have been set up to remember the victims of the final solution, particularly in Jer Jerusalem, the Yad Vashem, and Washington, D.C. In 1953, the Israeli parliament passed a law making it a duty of the State of Israel to recognize the work done by non-Jews in saving Jewish lives during the war and awarding, awarding them the honor writers among the nations. Euthanasia. In early 1938, the work-shy and anti-social elements of the population began to be rounded up and put in concentration camps. The doctor's command proposed for the worthless to be murdered once the war had created the opportunity to carry out this program. Since the summer of 1939, the Nazi regime developed a euthanasia program for the systematic killing of mentally and physically handicapped children and adults. Elite bombing raids. 
The Allied bombing raids was one of the most controversial episodes in the strategic air offensive against Germany, but Hitler began to bomb Britain in the summer of 1940 and the British responded. The Allies started with the raids against the Ruhrgebiet and Cologne. In July 1943, the Royal Air Force attacked Hamburg and trigger, triggered a firestorm that killed 30,000 civilians and left half a million homeless. A similar wars attack followed against Dresden in February 1945. Um, the US Bomber Command started with the daylight attacks on Berlin, Magdeburg and Chemnitz. Uh, Dresden was attacked in two uh, waved three hours apart, dropping over 1.5 uh, thousand tons of high explosive bombs uh, and other bombs which started a firestorm. Um, which caused the life of around th 30,000 people and uh, much of the city being dev devastated. Expulsions and forced mass deportations. Forced mass deportations seldom took place without violence, often murderous violence. As people did not leave their homes on their own and resisted deportations orders, forced deportations often became genocidal. Both in the Balkan Wars and in the World War I, forced deportation and population exchange became a regular part of war making as well as peacemaking. The so-called population exchange between the Orthodox from Anatolia and the Muslims from Macedonia and the Thras in 1922-23 was seen as a role model for the, by the British, the Germans and the Soviets. The first flights and expulsions in Hitler's empire occurred in October 1938 when thousands of Czechs, Jews and German opponents of the Nazis fled from the Sudetenland. A second wave followed in March 1939. Then, Forced uh, mass deportations followed the German and the Soviet invasions of Poland in September 1939. In the fall uh, of 1944, started the flight of millions of Germans from East Prussia, West Prussia, Upper Silesia, Slovakia, the Banat, the Baczka, and the Slavonia. At the end of the war, half of the uh, Germans in East Central Europe were on the move or in concentration camps. Responsibility and guilt. During the war, at the latest in 1942, the principle of collective responsibility and consequently of collective guilt of the Germans were, was widely accepted among the Allied leaders. Reports of Nazi ex extermination activities against Jews, Poles, Russians and Serbs, as well as further extermination projects, developed the contemporary idea of the collective guilt of all Germans who did not join the anti-Nazi resistance or did not become victims of national socialism. Mm, the crimes committed in the name of the German people made Germanophobia an almost universal feeling in the most belligerent countries. Um, the Nuremberg uh, Tribunal had, uh, with four, uh, count, ha had four counts of crimes um, uh, for a selected number of German leaders. The first was planning, preparing, initiating, or waging wars again, uh, wars of aggression. The second was participating in a common plan to accomplish any of the foregoing. The third was war crimes, including murder, ill treatment, and deportations of civilians uh, and prisons, uh, prisoners of war. The fourth was crimes against humanity. Um, the onset of the Cold War meant that countless Nazis and fascists became upstanding members of post-war police and civil administrations on both sides of the Iron Curtain. The Nuremberg Tribunal, while setting an important precedent for trying war crimes and crimes against humanity, hypocritically, it, uh, however, understandably, omitted the crimes of the elite victors, most notably the Soviet Union. Um, now, speaking of Holocaust, um, in his latest book, Timothy Snyder is arguing that Jews almost never survived after the Nazis had destroyed any state protection. They started in Austria on the evening of the March 11, 1938. Um, but this cannot be said for Slovakia after Slovak German uh, arrangements on deportations of Jews to the uh, general uh, government and for Hungary after the German occupation in March 1944. Therefore, sovereignty was not always a good shelter against perse persecutions. However, the Nazi genocide of Jews created an unusual opportunity for many ethnic clean cleansers elsewhere in Europe. It is not possible to 
equate the horror of national socialism against the Jews with the horror of revenge and expulsion. The genocides in the Nazi extermination camps and by the SS Einsatzgruppen are the symbol of the greatest crime that has ever been unleashed, but it is possible to compare the Heidrichiat and the concentration camp of the Ustasha in Jasenovac with the Czechoslovak concentration camps and those of the partisans in the Vojvodina in Slavonia and Lower Styria after May 1945. Many East Europeans but also some West Europeans seemed to have absorbed the lessons of Nazis' ethnic cleansing by brutally expelling their German populations and that had often lived in those localities for centuries. The most victims were civilians, elders, women and children, where they died from uh, starvation, illness and torture. Meanwhile, the judicial retribution and political purges had elsewhere in Europe uh, held uh, elsewhere in Europe. The heads of state of prime ministers who were executed after the war included those of Italy, France, Norway, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, Serbia, and Bulgaria. The list of non-German Europeans executed for treason, collaboration, and war crimes included thousands of generals, police chiefs, city mayors, politicians, and journalists. Amazingly, the harshest sentences were pronounced in Norway, Denmark, and the Netherlands. Um, remembrance and historization. In May 2005, the well-known Heidelberg professor for social history, Reinhard Kozelek, born in 1923, therefore a member of the so-called war generation, formulated the principal question for the remembrance of World War II. What are the consequences of the fact that although we have a common history in Europe, but no common experience? Seventy years after the end of World War II, the memories of political decisions, legal acts, crimes against humanity, genocides and expulsions in Europe in the first half of the 20th century are still present. Um, Germans and Austrians had, both, had been both perpetrators and victims and no, had no words for their state of mind. Many were traumatized and could not bear to talk about the crucial, their crucial experiences. Despite the disastrous behave, behavior of the Red Army in Eastern Austria in 1945 and the continuing fear of the population for kidnapping and deportation, the state treaty in May um, 1945 and the retreat of the Soviet Army in October 1955 ended these bad experiences. The last survivors of the Gulag and the POW camps returned as did some of the people who had been kidnapped by the NKVD and KGB on charges of anti-Soviet actions after 45. Eastern Austria was spurred the fate of its eastern neighbors that underwent Stalinization and Sovietization. Therefore, Stalinism never became a central issue of collective memory in that country. Uh, a new phase of, German, of West German, not so much of Austrian, coping with the past began in the early 60s, after the Israel Secret Service captured the former SS uh, Standartenführer Adolf Eichmann, one of the chief organizers of the Holocaust in Argentina, took him to court at Jer Jerusalem and executed him. In 19, um, then the next important step was uh, the year 1979, uh, West Germany, Austria aired Holocaust, an American television series um, which shocked West Germans and Austrians into a new round of soul searching. Um, then I have to skip the following pages, sorry. Um, Europe survived the second 30 years war between 1914 and 48. Not since the 30 years war of the 17th century had such a large proportion of the European population suffered the pains of war. Many Europeans had acted badly, not only as politicians, officers, and policemen, but also as economists, technicians, doctors, intellectuals, journalists, even priests. Under the conditions of two world wars and its consequences, as well as the strong influence of several ideologies, there were almost no barrier to violence against the other. Populist nationalism, nationalistic and religious hatred, and the imagined fighting against the class enemy, as well as the imagined fighting between the races, led to a European-wide crisis in compassion and humanity. Not only were most Europeans indifferent to the fate of their Jewish, Roma, and other uh, neighbors, but millions among them participated in manhunt, 
or at least profited from the disappearances and deaths of the victims. There, uh, there were many who risked their lives for the persecuted, especially priests, nuns, doctors, and the individuals who did not like to fit into normal society. But too many accepted the witch hunt. Um, after 1945, the United States and the Soviet Union imposed a new order in Europe, dividing and organizing the European states in what became a remarkably stable and peaceful system. The most European nations, of course not the global power Soviet Union, decided, decided for rearmament. First the West and South European nations became at peace with one another, then the Central European nations, most of them joined the NATO and then the European communities. But the danger of nuclear war ran through the foundations of the post-war European order. Nonetheless, European governments made no serious efforts at civil defense. Between 1940 and 80, the European empires had lost the most of their overseas possessions. In all Western European countries, the civilian state uh, increased. The budget of post-war states revealed their civilian nature. The result was an eclipse of violence in both meanings of the word. Violence declined in importance and it was concealed from view by something else, that is, by the state's need to encourage economic growth, provide social, wel social welfare, and guarantee personal security for its citizens. In an address to the United Nations on December 7, 1988, uh, Gorbachev declared that force and the threat of force should not be instruments of foreign policy. Although the German reunification I know, I know, and the dissolution of the Soviet Union occurred peacefully, violence dim diminished but did not disappear from European public life, as in Northern Ireland, the Basque province, or in Cyprus. And, uh, the war in Bosnia-Herzegovina the clash between Serbia and Kosovo and the clash between Russia and Ukraine showed that some backlashes can happen, at least in Eastern Europe. At the first two theaters, the NATO intervened successfully, but this was not possible on the Crimean Peninsula and in the Donetsk area. So the main challenge is continuing. How to run Europe without violence? Thank you.